Well, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to another Coney meeting, uh, coming live uh, virtually. Uh, next year, we'll be live in person. Uh, but I think you'll see we have a wonderful program for Parkinson's disease, both today and again tomorrow, focusing on some key controversies in our field. And I think we have an esteemed faculty that will be able to uh, navigate some of these topics, uh, debate them fully, and, and allow um, participants to uh, vote and then see how we Hello, uh, I'm Ray Chowdhury, a neurologist and Parkinson specialist and professor of uh, movement disorders and neurology here at King's College. And I'm also the director of the Parkinson's Foundation Center here at King's College. I'm delighted to have been asked to fight against my friend and colleague, Professor Angela Antonini, uh, talking about this very emotive subject of whether COVID-19 infection and the pandemic that we've had will lead to an emergence of um, a lot of cases with Parkinsonism, and I'm, I'm taking the yes uh, aspect of it. Um, and these are my disclosures uh, for your perusal. And I'll go straight into the first slide, which is a vignette of uh, my various times with Professor Antonini, who of course will make the case that, um, that firstly, uh, um, any sort of acute intervention such as surgery or infection might unmask Parkinsonism. So COVID has unmasked Parkinson's, what's, what's so great about it. You will probably also touch on the fact that uh, epidemiologically, if you expect a certain number of cases to occur from what we know about the prevalence of this condition 
And if we then think that COVID-19 would have affected large part of this population, it's unlikely to show that there's an epidemiological increase uh, in the number of cases of Parkinsonism following COVID. But my argument is a little bit different. I will look more on the fact of the etiopathology of Parkinson's and how the SARS-CoV-2 virus might have a specific effect on the dopaminergic neuron and the fact we cannot really predict therefore the future. Well, firstly, it's well known that various viruses and pathogens can increase the risk for Parkinson's. Of course, the critics will say it's unmasking the signs of Parkinson's. Nevertheless, the fact is we do know, for instance, with Coxsackie, with hepatitis C, with um, HIV, there has been reports of post-infectious Parkinsonism, clinically similar, but not, not, may not be totally identical to what we see as idiopathic Parkinson's. What we also know that during the 1918 flu, the Spanish influenza, which has a lot of similarity to COVID, um, we also thought that it will end in 1918 when the pandemic rate subsided, but in fact, it didn't. We know that there was a chronic effect and this chronic effect could also be true for COVID, which we haven't realized yet, because as you know, neurodegeneration has a long prodromal period. And in fact, if we look at the lessons we learned from Spanish influenza, it led to the uh, encephalitis lethargica syndrome, which was, which was uh, recognized as post-encephalitic with the influenza-like prodrome. And we also know, this is very interesting, that people who were born during this period when there were a lot of these uh, influenzas, they had a two to three times increased risk of Parkinson's during this period. Therefore, whether there will be a similar event after COVID cannot certainly be ruled out. And this cannot certainly be ruled out if we think there's a pathophysiological basis to this concept. Is there a pathophysiological basis? Well, firstly, we now know that the influenza virus, H5N1 in this case, can enter the central nervous system, can cause neurodegeneration via neuroinflammation. And here are uh, various pictures, which I don't have time to go through, showing um, uh, the aggregated alpha synuclein and activated microglia in a uh, uninfected um, mice versus infected mice. So you can see that already the pathophysiological evidence, but this is influenza. What about COVID-19 or the coronavirus itself or SARS-CoV-2? Well, firstly, a most recent paper from uh, Nature in 2022 showing that SARS-CoV-2 has approximately 2% reduction in the brain structure. And this brain structure reduction falls a lot on the olfactory pathway, the, the parahippocampal gyrus, but also involves some of the midbrain and the limbic structures, which are intimately and closely associated in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's. Not just that, we also have clinical evidence, which Professor Antonini is an author in, showing that post-COVID, the so-called long COVID syndrome, is quite prevalent in Parkinson's. And in fact, this therefore suggests that the virus can persist in the, in the condition and can cause symptoms typically three months after the initial uh, infection, which might even be asymptomatic. We also know, and this is again, Professor Antonini's work with ourselves, that there are links with Parkinson's from bench to bedside. He's an author in this paper. And what does he and we all say? Well, firstly, we see there are four possible routes where the uh, viral induced Parkinsonism might occur. And while three of them are indirect and could be related to encephalopathy, hypercytokinemia, as well as loss of vascular integrity, but also the pivotal role of the angiotensin in converting enzyme to enzyme receptors, hypoxic brain injury, but also possibly a direct tropism from basal ganglia replication and neuronal lysis. And this is again further borne out by that nature paper that I just showed you. And there are some further more evidences. And this is perhaps the fact that hyposmia is a well-known associate of COVID-19 and hyposmia is a well-known prodromal feature of Parkinson. And this study, which specifically looked at hyposmic 
COVID infected people, you can see moderate, severe, and as bad as, as it can be, um, hyposmia is rated by a substantial proportion of people, therefore highlighting the importance of the olfactory pathway and possible neurotropic potential activating through the ACE2, NRP, NRP1, and TMPRSS2 receptors. These are all olfactory epithelium and enteric nervous system uh, uh, regions. And as you know, again, the dual hit hypothesis is also popular, popular now, particularly the body first hypothesis for development of Parkinson's. So there is another potential positive route of a dual hit, not just olfactory pathway, but also the gut. And this then can bind to the ACE2 receptors. I would like you to look at the middle section of the right, with the top is the MERS, the Middle East uh, uh, epidemic that we had in the past. And the bottom is the SARS, the original SARS, and the middle is the SARS-CoV-2 with a very prominent ACE2 receptor, which binds closely to the ACE2 expressed in the brain. And we have evidence, for instance, from this slide, that the ACE2 receptors are widely distributed within the brain, but also now we know that the Niagara, as well as the dorsal motor nucleus of the medulla, uh, as well as the ventrolateral medulla, all areas, as you know, very closely involved in the, in the Brock uh, hypothesis, are also actually uh, heavily uh, populated with ACE2 receptors where the coronavirus is binding, strongest binding. And this has been nicely put together in, which could be my topic really, in Patrick Brunden's uh, review paper showing the, the cascade of pathway, vascular damage, systemic inflammation, neuroinvasion. This could be acute and then there is a long-term effect, which is what I'm going on about. So epidemiology and the current acute scenario cannot really predict the long-term effect. And, this, and there are enough pathophysiological substrates we talked about that can be relevant here. T-cell in, uh, infiltration, microglial activation, astrocyte activation, loss of striatal dopamine. And there is also evidence that in marmoset, at least in one study, when SARS-CoV-2 infection can actually include intracytoplasmic inclusion, which mimics uh, levy bodies. There is also more recent evidence that further inf inf uh, in uh, involvement of the toll-like receptor 4 can also um, develop a cascade of pathway where they're producing pro-inflammatory cytokines in animal model. This leads to healthy dopaminergic neuronal damage. This can then aggravate the misfolding of alpha synuclein with Lewy neurites and Levy body formation. So this is this is this is also there. So there is enough pathophysiological substrate to suggest all these pathways might be involved. And sure, it can also unmask prodromal PD. I'm not refuting that at all. And we also know that there is a high incidence, well, relatively high of encephalopathy. So what we're saying, not everybody but those who develop severe or develop severe encephalopathy with SARS-CoV-2, which are rates of which are likely to be lower now because we have effective antivirals available now, but in the early stage, and there are 138 confirmed cases that's been reported, but more have been probably developed. In this case, all of those cascading pathways might be, might be activated. And these are the patients who might be particularly at risk for future development of Parkinson's. It may not reflect on the epidemiological figures, but for these individual cases, the risk is certainly higher. So we would have to consider the possibility of these cases developing this Parkinsonism. And interesting to see that this is a very recent piece of work which Irabura with myself has done. We've already found 20 cases where there is an association with COVID that is within two years of this pandemic. These are patients where often there is no family history, hyposmia, anosmia in some. Some have been had encephalopathy, although the screening has been negative. Uh, CSF has also been negative, but uptake, dopaminergic uptake has been abnormal in all the cases where it has been done. And some have responded to levodopa, others have responded to immunosuppressive therapy, uh, showing underpinning an encephalopathic autoimmune etiology. Here is an example. 
uh, patient with acute hypokinetic rigid syndrome following a SARS-CoV-2 infection. This patient had an acute um, acute Parkinsonism, not typical Parkinson's disease. You can see the Florida PET scan showing a gross um, uh, reduced uptake of fluoridopa, particularly in the vitaminal area. And there are several other papers, and I've elected to show you this one. <clears throat> this is a, a probable Parkinson's disease. This patient had a fairly mild core SARS CoV 2 infection and developed a classic uh, tremor dominant idiopathic Parkinson's picture, lividopa responsive, once again with a positive um, uh, presynaptic dopamine terminal uh, cell loss. So, and these patients look very similar to Parkinson's. How can we there, therefore say that the, that the previous infection is not um, uh, risking a future uh, large number of cases coming out? If we are already seeing cases now, even though I agree that, that in part, this might also be the possibility of unmasking, but it's a bit coincidental, isn't it? Infection, all this pathology with the nigrostriatal pathway, the S2 receptors, the toll-like receptors all being affected, and then you're seeing cases with a direct temporal link. So I think we come to the end, and I would like to end on a philosophical note, particularly Iro, who's helped me with this presentation. There's this a sentence by George uh, Santana saying, those who remember, cannot remember the past, you can then to repeat it. And I go back to the 1980 pan uh, pandemic and a lot of people said, well, it's not going to have a long-term consequence, don't worry. So we also need to think about a little bit about imagination rather than orders. So I think we need to also be a little bit imaginative and say what we really need to think about patients with significant enteritis or neurological illness may well be susceptible to future wave of Parkinsonism. However, this may not be reflected in epidemiological figures per se. And we really need vigilance, especially in the long term. And we need well-defined these patients who have been severely ill with COVID, either with severe hyposmia, severe enterobitis, do need following up in the long term, because I do believe this might be a perfect storm, but we will not probably know for another five to 10 years. I'd like to thank all the people in our group who helped me put together some of the papers that I showed you, and particularly Euro. And I hope Professor Antonini's response or repost is not too, um, not too um, damaging for my, my um, theory. Uh, and I would look forward to res responding to his uh, debating um, uh, skills and debating uh, sub uh, debating topic um, as soon as possible after and I look forward to hearing to what he says thank you hello everyone uh, good evening and uh, thank you for attending this uh, COVID debate uh, I'm uh, uh, Professor Angelo Antonini uh, from the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Unit at the University of Padua in Italy. And uh, as you have heard uh, uh, from uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Rachel Dury, we will discuss uh, the possibility uh, that COVID-19 is or is not the perfect storm for emergence of Parkinsonism. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, my friend Ray has already uh, broadly highlighted uh, uh, the links between COVID manifestations and early presymptomatic Parkinson. However, I would like to uh, give uh, a bit different view uh, to the evidence that I'm sure Ray has brought up to you. First of all, uh, let me remind you that uh, COVID uh, did start uh, uh, somehow in Italy after the initial first few cases that are reported in Wuhan in China. And uh, at the end of February, uh, the carnival in Venice uh, was uh, blooming. And in the middle of the carnival, uh, we had, uh, as the New York Times reported, a cluster of cases. Uh, in Italy, and as it says, that kindled fears in Europe. 
the uh, problem was uh, that the cases of COVID uh, uh, really from there uh, rapidly spread uh, or were already present possibly uh, in most uh, regions in Europe and quickly involved uh, many, many countries. Uh, the uh, uh, COVID uh, initial manifestations of the first variants were mainly related to the uh, interstitial pneumonia and it became evident that COVID uh, and the spike, uh, viral spike, were binding to the ACE2 receptors in humans that facilitated dissemination uh, in the body. But essentially also uh, it was obvious uh, that uh, most cases, uh, symptomatic cases of COVID, um, uh, at least in the initial phase, uh, were related uh, to uh, the uh, inflammatory, broad inflammatory response that occurred in the body uh, as uh, the immune system uh, became, came in co to contact with a virus that had never been exposed to in the previous uh, uh, life of the person. One of the symptoms that uh, immediately uh, uh, brought the attention uh, to the possibility that COVID uh, might be uh, smelling uh, like Parkinson, or there may be a link between COVID and Parkinson, was the uh, manifestation in many cases and some in people that we have all seen uh, in our working and private life, that uh, the uh, uh, presence uh, uh, of uh, smell deficits uh, might have been a so-called pre-symptomatic uh, manifestation of COVID. In other words, uh, the COVID virus and the spike were inducing an inflammation in the uh, neuroepithelium, leading to the development uh, uh, of uh, uh, loss of smell, uh, which resembled somehow the uh, loss of smell we frequently observe in uh, Parkinson patients uh, some uh, years or decades before modern onset. So I'm sure that uh, Ray has already uh, broadly discussed this and uh, brought this to your attention as an argument favoring the possibility that uh, uh, COVID might trigger a symptomatic uh, manifestation, which is similar to the onset of Parkinson's disease. Well, uh, we investigated this extensively and uh, we mm, developed uh, a instrument for uh, survey and to assess uh, uh, presence of uh, smell uh, and taste deficits in people who had been exposed to COVID. Uh, and with this questionnaire that we published uh, uh, last year, we were able to uh, define uh, patients and monitor patients' manifestations, talking here about COVID patients. And we also, uh, quite interestingly, uh, discovered that many people were declaring that their smell uh, was normal or had returned to normal. But if you were testing a smell function with a sniffing stick, among those who were reporting relatively normal uh, functionality, there were a significant proportion, about one third, were still manifesting deficits uh, using a, a sniffing test. And similar, among those who uh, were saying uh, that the, there was a uh, relatively uh, uh, normal uh, olfactory dysfunction, uh, many uh, were uh, having uh, actually uh, olfactory deficits uh, at a sniffing stick. So there was a proportion uh, of people who were uh, normal at a sniffing stick, but they were declaring to have olfactory dysfunction. And another subset, even richer subset, who had after three, six months after COVID, we are reporting normal function, but indeed they had uh, uh, olfactory deficits. So this is uh, just to remind you that if you rely solely on a patient or personal reporting, you may be misled by the fact that many people continue to have the perception 
of persisting disturbances, but their smelling tests will be normal. And others um, who indeed do have uh, olfactory dysfunction, uh, even three, six months after uh, COVID, and they perceive this as relatively normal. So uh, claiming that uh, the smell uh, assessment is a useful tool to discriminate uh, uh, um, people who are at risk of Parkinsonism, I think uh, it is uh, quite hard to uh, say and to claim unless you use uh, a sniffing stick test uh, rather than a self-reported questionnaire or interview. Now, one of the arguments favoring the link between COVID and Parkinson was uh, that if you have a problem with your neuroepithelium and uh, uh, the neuroepithelium and your factory nerve may represent uh, uh, an entry point uh, uh, to, into the brain uh, of the virus, which would uh, lead uh, potentially trigger uh, to an inflammatory response in the brain and eventually to the disease. We described this uh, uh, very early with, uh, uh, in a group in an article where David Sulzer was leading. Uh, in this article, we reported the possible uh, manifestations of COVID and how they could potentially uh, act as a trigger uh, of Parkinson's disease. But let's face a few <coughs> uh, clear-cut uh, uh, evidence uh, and check if this is supporting or not uh, the uh, possible link uh, between COVID and Parkinson. First of all, we reviewed uh, uh, the uh, patients uh, coming to the emergency room uh, with COVID just to check if people with Parkinson were particularly vulnerable to acute COVID manifestations who might require hospital admission or an evaluation at the emergency room. So we reviewed uh, a total of uh, more than 1,300 cases. <clears throat> and out of these cases, uh, we uh, reported and collected uh, those uh, who had uh, neurological manifestations, at least uh, at time of entry. Now, 15 cases, only 1% uh, had Parkinson. That doesn't mean much, but it shows uh, that even in a period of a uh, very severe outbreak of COVID, where there was uh, uh, nothing to do but uh, enter a lockdown uh, during the first uh, months of 2020. Well, in this case, Parkinson patients uh, didn't show a selective vulnerability. And well, you may argue, why should they? Well, because if, if COVID uh, uh, is uh, somehow triggering or aggravating or producing an inflammatory response that has an impact on the dopamine system, you might see more Parkinson patients coming into the hospital uh, as uh, they may appear uh, present uh, uh, some complications, either the disease or related to the COVID, but that was not the case. Also, when uh, myself uh, and uh, uh, Rachel Dury and uh, Valentina Leita and uh, their group uh, reviewed the number of patients who were uh, admitted uh, uh, to the hospital and eventually had a negative outcome, so uh, in some cases uh, passed away due to COVID, uh, we found that, that one very important factor was standing out. That was. Uh, a severity of the disease and a prolonged disease duration. So except that three cases who had a relatively short disease duration, all others were people with a long history of Parkinson. And in these three cases with relatively short disease duration, the age of the patients was 94, 87, and 83 years. So where quite elderly people were probably more fragile, even if the Parkinson was not so severe. So it seems that old age and long Parkinson duration may make people more vulnerable, but not vulnerable to an eventual aggravation of the COVID, but rather to the inflammatory consequences of COVID. Four of these patients passed away, by the way. Uh, I uh, reviewed another uh, uh, article 
appeared in the journal Neurology last year, where the fate uh, of uh, Parkinson patients uh, who suffered from COVID was reviewed. And from this article, it seems uh, that having Parkinson disease uh, is not an independent risk factor for severe COVID and death. So again, more evidence suggesting that uh, if you had a bad COVID, either you had Parkinson or not, uh, that might have affected uh, you quite dramatically, uh, leading to the, you to the hospital, and in some cases uh, into the ICU and maybe death. Another uh, analysis has been done using a phone survey, the largest one is uh, from Fasano and Artusi, and uh, the figures reporting uh, uh, mortality and severity, severe Parkinson in Parkinson patients versus control uh, shows that there is no difference. The uh, other aspect is uh, if in some cases uh, there are long-term manifestations, are they any different from what we see in the long-term COVID syndrome? Uh, well, uh, Valentina later uh, again reviewed this, and if you look at the symptoms that these people were presenting, uh, even if they were Parkinson patients, they resemble very much those uh, that people with uh, uh, long-term COVID that we are complaining about. So it seems that even in uh, long-term COVID uh, manifestations, there is nothing specific about Parkinson compared with a control population. To the contrary, uh, we reported that, that if you are actively managing uh, disease manifestations, uh, even during the lockdown period, uh, you could actually preserve a relatively good mobility and quality of life. Maybe the only factor, the only change we saw in this analysis on the impact of social mobility restrictions in PD during COVID lockdown period in 2020 was an increased risk of falls, which is maybe related to the fact that people were not walking much uh, and were spending most time in the house. But again, this may not be that specific of Parkinson. Is this uh, uh, impact maybe related uh, uh, to the lack of care? Uh, well, uh, this has been our hypothesis and uh, Ray and a group of colleagues, including me, uh, reviewed the strategies that might actually help Parkinson patients to manage uh, the disease better, but nothing to do uh, with uh, establishing a link between COVID uh, and uh, increased risk of Parkinson. I would just like to show you two cases. One is uh, a lady I've been following now for many years. She has a disease duration of 29 years. She's in a nursing home. She had COVID November 2020, fever, fatigue, cough, and she was treated with antibiotics and uh, uh, didn't require a respirator, but uh, supplemented with oxygen. Uh, but she recovered completely, and now she's back uh, as she was uh, with uh, fixed postures, uh, some respiratory problems, uh, but not much uh, in terms of clinical manifestations. This other one is an interesting lady, and I've seen quite a few. She probably had the first manifestations in uh, the beginning of 2021. Uh, so when she came, uh, she came because after COVID, she had noticed uh, uh, some smell dysfunction in March, and she had noticed some modest bradykinesia. You can see that her pronosupination is really mildly affected here on the right side. She had no tremor. And uh, she wanted to know uh, if uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, these manifestations were related to the COVID or to a possible Parkinson. Now, the DASCAN was abnormal. Interestingly, she had smell deficits with COVID and part of the smell improved after COVID. Now, you may argue, well, this case, how do you know that the Parkinson was not aggravated or because uh, uh, when I interviewed her in details, uh, she claimed that, that uh, her clinical manifestations uh, just suddenly got, came to her attention 
but her husband had already noticed some slowness before. So it might well be that when you have COVID and inflammatory response, this uh, brings, uh, is bringing to light uh, the clinical manifestations. Uh, and uh, if you look at the total number of cases, and I'm sure that Ray is uh, communicated to you that there are many more, but not more than 20 cases reported so far. Uh, I refrained to report a case like that one because I think it was just a coincidence. But over a period of uh, two years, of at least in one and a half year, about uh, 236 million COVID patients have been reported after October 2021. And by October 2021, there were only three published cases of Parkinsonism. It, maybe Rea should have reviewed this. And I really wonder whether this uh, are cases where uh, the, which just appeared during the COVID period. And the link with COVID when you have a pandemic of this kind, I think it's really hard to make. Uh, the uh, cases, uh, I'm not going to spend time with this because I'm sure again uh, that the uh, that Ray has discussed them. They all are responded to Libodoba. The Daskan was abnormal, indicating that, that, that the abnormality in Daskan was there for a long time. Uh, and these uh, changes are certainly uh, not uh, occurred uh, uh, in a short period. Uh, so this is again uh, in a similar case uh, from Israel uh, reported, uh, uh, which improved uh, on Pramipexon. I wonder how come that this case was uh, 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 published in the Lancet Neurology. I think it makes no, absolutely no sense to me. Uh, I refrain to report that lady, and I think if you interview them in details, these people uh, would tell you that they had uh, abnormalities uh, well before uh, uh, COVID uh, or maybe shortly before COVID. And the COVID infection just brought this uh, to clinical evidence. So with this, uh, I would like to close. Uh, this is my team and uh, uh, I'm very happy to take questions and discuss with you this uh, uh, very interesting topic uh, and hopefully uh, have a, a very nice debate and a fantastic uh, CONI meeting. Thank you very much. As, as expected, a robust uh, discussion. I think uh, we didn't see the vote before, but the vote was 60 yes and 40% no. Um, and before you get a chance to vote again, why don't we give Professor Chowdhury a chance to rebut uh, uh, his colleagues' uh, views. Ray, does he hi, change your hi, mind? Hi. Uh, good to see you, Stuart. And of course, very nice to see you, Angelo, looking very summery wherever you yes, are. Yes, I'm in Rome. Um, <laughs> sounds like you're, looks like you're in another Rome. meeting <laughs> for a change. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think, the points raised by Professor Antonini are perfectly valid, but I think I would like to make one point that I think Angela was talking more about the effect of COVID on Parkinson's disease. Um, I was trying to make the point that um, COVID, from what we've seen so far, can have an effect on new onset Parkinsonism which is what the data in fact does. The fact that we've actually seen 20 cases, even though they are, could be argued they're coincidental, there is a link in some patients, certainly the one case that was, um, I think the, not the Lancet Neurology one, the one I showed, which was a gentleman, an Ashkenazi Jewish gentleman who had um, uh, a very mild COVID, and then three months later developed a classic levodopa response to Parkinsonism, um, is is uh, somewhat concerning. And we do have the pathophysiological basis, and we now know that the ACE2 receptors, which the virus binds to very closely, like SARS, like MERS, um, is also distributed in the nigral area is also distributed in the brainstem, particularly the dorsal nucleus of the vagus. It's not just a vasculature as was previously thought. So whatever the mechanism might be, and I think we'll learn that, I think it's too early at this moment in time to categorically say there is no effect. I think there is a 
good chance that people, as again, I've made the point, who are encephalopathic with this illness, that might be a small number, but might be reflected with Parkinsonism, new onset Parkinsonism, not necessarily Parkinson's disease in future. And I don't think we can absolutely rule it out uh, with the evidence that we have. And let's not forget that going back to the mid nineties, uh, there was a very nice paper from Stan Fahn and colleagues showing that the effect of coronavirus, but of course not SARS-CoV-2, could be, uh, could be manifest in the CSF and it stays in the CSF and has a di direct nigral action, uh, toxic action. And we've seen this with influenza as well. We've seen this with HIV as well. So I think there is a pathophysiological basis where whether or not that will translate to epidemiological basis, I don't know. But I still think that we can't rule this out completely. And the evidence that we see in these cases does make one wonder if this is going to be the case. Whether it would be a giant wave, I don't know, but there may well be increased uh, numbers coming through. Angelo? Well, uh, no, thank He's you, Sue. Thank you, Ray. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, uh, then we, we come uh, to discussion, of course, our positions are not uh, that distant. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I agree with Ray that there have been uh, cases uh, starting uh, uh, shortly after uh, COVID uh, exposure and I uh, showed one uh, of one lady, which is quite similar to yours, Ray. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I'm, my argument is uh, that the, before we can claim that there is an increase in number of Parkinson patients uh, due to the fact that they have been exposed to COVID, uh, it might take several years at the moment. Uh, I think the safe interpretation is uh, that this is somehow coincidental given the large number of COVID people, uh, people who suffer from COVID and also the uh, uh, relatively not that modest uh, incidence of Parkinson every year. But uh, overall, I think uh, there is uh, both the presentations uh, uh, we are focusing on increasing vigilance uh, and surveillance uh, uh, on the fact that uh, maybe there is a link in uh, some selected cases. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there is another vote, uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, the vote is between a COVID pandemic, uh, uh, say, triggering a Parkinson pandemic, or Parkinson is going to be there, uh, maybe not that much increased after COVID, uh, and the number of cases we will see uh, will be pretty much the same. So far, I've not seen any storm of people coming to my clinic uh, complaining about new onset Parkinson. The same incidents I saw in the past, but this is anecdotal, of course. Well, we definitely are going to vote again, but uh, we have a question that came in. Um, so let me ask you, Volta, whoever. Um, if COVID-19 will increase Parkinson's, do you think it's causal? Do you think it's a second hit type of idea? Or do you think it's unmasking uh, Parkinson's that was going to come out eventually in a couple of years? Or do you th I think, Angela, you think it's completely coincidental? No, I mean, I mean sorry if I uh, step in, uh, Ray. I think it is both unmasking and coincidental. So we know that anytime, uh, you know, this is quite common for people with Parkinson's. They tell you, you know, I had a surgery, I had a general anesthesia, and then I woke up, I had a bit of a tremor. And that's, you know, when it started. I think, you know, any inflammatory process, any more invasive procedure can unmask uh, uh, somehow a form of uh, Parkinsonism. So if you have a sub-threshold uh, degeneration of dopamine system and you are exposed um, to some triggering event, uh, that might be uh, what happens when you unmask a specific manifestation. On the other hand, I think there is also a bit of a coincidence when you say, I had COVID three months ago and now I have Parkinson, and your DAT scan shows a 50% loss of dopamine nerve terminals. That would mean that you had a massive new invasion from the virus, you know. Uh, but then it is compatible only with encephalitis. I mean, in the CSF, uh, I was never able to document. Uh, 
uh, the virus, uh, uh, the COVID virus, when we did uh, uh, lumbar puncture in people in coma with, uh, with COVID. So, uh, I mean, there have been some cases where the virus was um, identified in the brain stem, and we have an article under review on this and the autopsy brains. But, uh, uh, I mean, in my opinion, is uh, you know, some trigger event I'm asking or coincidental mostly. I think I would go along with that. I think it could be both phenomenon from what we've so far now. The unmasking element of it is clearly there uh, in some patients. Uh, but, you know, it, these are anecdotal, independent individual reports. But in the end, it's the collection of these reports that will guide us to what, where we are going to be. But the fact that there is already 20 cases also, one has to think about it. You know, have we, we've had many other viral infections and viral epidemics. You know, we had Ebola, we had um, all sorts of things, but we didn't see a cluster uh, or at least a worldwide recognition of these cases. But having said that, uh, perhaps people were not specifically looking for those links. I don't know. Ray, you pointed out some uh, substantia nigra pathology. Do you think the constellation of symptoms from COVID-19, if it uh, leads to Parkinson's, will be more motor? Or you think you'll see the similar non-motor component or, or more non-motor? Well, again, as I think Angela mentioned this as well, we have this, we have seen the so-called long COVID spectrum in Parkinson's as well. And that is very dominated by a lot of non-motor issues, such as fatigue in particular, along with perhaps a bit of somnolence, unmasking of depression. But of course, it's difficult to tell because these patients are also in the middle of a pandemic. They're in a lockdown. Their Parkinson in motor state has been reported to deteriorate during the COVID period. So there's a mixture of things, but I suspect that also the olfactory deficit is another non-motor aspect of it, but I suspect that there will be equal smattering of motor and non-motor, and maybe though it might be more weighted towards non-motor. Great. Any closing comments before we turn to the vote? The re-vote? Re-vote. Like America, we re-vote. Re-vote. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. We'll see you later in the debates today. And um, let's turn back now to the vote and see who sways. That's okay. But uh, we will uh, keep arguing. Uh, Angela, I, I think when Ray suggested a meeting in Dubai, he swayed yes. some votes. Yes, that's right. We will do it live in Dubai next time. <laughs> okay, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thanks a lot. Bye.